What has sex got to do with it? Welcome to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. In this episode, we discuss sex and the human body, what our culture prescribes about our bodies to shield us from death anxiety. We're going to play for you an interview we conducted with Dr. Jamie Goldenberg a few years ago. Jamie Lynn Goldenberg, Ph.D., is professor of psychology at the University of South Florida. She has published articles in academic journals on the impact of the awareness of death on human motivation and on examining people's attitudes toward their physical, mortal bodies, women's bodies in particular. She recently published a novel, Finding Jolie. She is also an artist. Here's the interview with Dr. Goldenberg. Jamie Goldenberg, Ph.D., is an experimental social psychologist. She's currently working on the implications of Ernest Becker's ideas for attitudes toward the body, sex, and women. She works from the empirical framework of terror management theory and has published her findings in a number of social psychological journals and book chapters. Dr. Goldenberg, welcome to Perspective. Thank you. Now, Jamie, we also had Jamie Arndt on our show the last time. Right. And he also is a terror management theorist, next generation. So let me ask you, are all terror management theorists named Jamie? <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a Jeff, Tom, and Sheldon. Do they too. make you change your name to Jamie? No, but there have been suspicions about that. that they're... <laughs> You're not the first to notice. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, they, they co- at a conference we were at together, we had shared a room, and they were joking about whether we were breeding Jamie's. And that oh. was our... <laughs> How funny. Yeah, but... All right, so let me ask you. Okay. What, in Becker's terms, is the civilizing process? Well, according to Becker, we're all in this unique existential situation in that we share with other animals instincts aimed at self-preservation, but yet we're different from other animals in that we are more cognitively sophisticated. And among other things, what this does is it renders us aware of the fact that inevitably we're going to die. But rather than be paralyzed with anxiety associated with this, what Becker suggests is that we deal with this threat by clinging to some kind of symbolic cultural worldview in which our own existence can be perceived as meaningful and our own behavior can be perceived as valuable. And so essentially what the civilizing process does is it forces us to change our own animal, natural sense of self-worth for a contrived symbolic one. All right, so our reality is contrived, it's symbolic, but yet we are animals. We have bodies. Why is the body a problem for human beings? Well, if the solution to the fears associated with death are to live our lives on this symbolic, abstract plane, well, then the, the body threatens the efficacy of these mechanisms. The body reminds us that we're animals nonetheless. And so we can try as hard as we'd like to pretend we're these symbolic creatures, but the body every time reminds us, takes us back to the basics and reminds us that we're just animals. Eric Fromm has a great quote where he says, he asks, why did man not go insane in the face of an existential contradiction between a symbolic self that seems to give him infinite worth in a timeless scheme of things and a body that's worth about 98 cents? (laughs) I think that sums up the situation pretty well. What is disgust? Well, ever since Charles Darwin first discussed disgust, (laughs) um, (laughs) a lot of researchers have studied this, and they've come to the conclusion that disgust is something that's uniquely human, that other animals have similar but not the same type of reactions. They have, you know, distaste to certain foods, and they experience, you know, fear associated with things that are threatening. But in humans, we have this disgust reaction, which is kind of, it's an ideological response to something that threatens ourself. So it's not necessarily distasteful, not necessarily dangerous. Um, It's a physiological response. It's a physiological and a psychological. Right. And some researchers, John Haight and um, Paul Rosen are some researchers who do work on disgust. And what they do is they look at, you know, what kind of stimuli people are disgusted by, and they show that, you know, that they... (laughs) They're very creative experiments, but they ask people their reactions to... Fear factor? Similar, yeah. Eating a sterilized cockroach 
okay. or drinking soup stirred with a never used fly swatter. I think they have having sex with a dead chicken and show that these are things that are not dangerous. They don't even necessarily taste bad. <laughs> with the chicken. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but that people respond with this disgust reaction to it. And so what they've come to the conclusion is that disgust is an ideological response to things that kind of blur the human animal boundary. And so the body, you know, the body and its functions and its byproducts are the things that people are most disgusted by. So you can see there's universal disgust associated with feces and mucus and blood, especially menstrual blood. But it's kind of interesting that tears are something that we don't share with other animals. And this is probably one of the only body products that we don't find disgusting. Well, that's true. Yeah. So does, does disgust have a psychological function? Well, what they suggest is that it probably evolved, that originally it did have a function. So it probably evolved out of this distaste associated with certain foods that posed a threat to ourselves, but that it's been kind of co-opted in humans. And that now it's more, it's an ideological response. So it's not necessarily that we're disgusted to things that are threatening to us. Well, they are threatening to us. They're threatening to us psychologically. So oh, I, I guess see. you could say it's adaptive from that. It's interesting. Yeah, it's threatening to us psych symbolically. Right. It threatens, because, our, right. it threatens our self. Right. Everyone has to go to the bathroom. And so, well, even the term go to the bathroom. I mean, you don't take a bath. Right. No. <laughs> right. Right. In the bathroom. Go to relieve yourself. I right. mean, what are the terms? Go sharpen but, my skates. Yeah, but every <laughs> single human being has to do it, and yet we nobody ever talks about it. Deal with it. You know, yeah. Yes. By it. This disgust manner. Yeah, Becker talks about the Chaga tribe. Oh, remember yeah. where they are? <laughs> yes. that, that they actually wear plugs in their anus so that they can pretend not to defecate. Right. So no kidding. That's an extreme, a, a secret, extreme yes. example. Right. Wow. Right. Uh, well, let's go back to culture for a minute. What is culture's role in denying our animality well, and why? Well, the culture, I mean, what it does, one thing is, is it tells us which aspects of our animality to be kept private. So bathroom behavior is one that we don't normally <laughs> talk about mm -hmm. in public. And then also what it does is it takes other aspects of our physicality or our animality and it sort of it strips them of their creatureliness through cultural prohibitions and prescriptions and standards. So the culture takes something that might otherwise be responded to with disgust, aspects of our physicality, and it transforms them into something symbolic. And so, you know, the body, we have see all over the media prescriptions for how the body is supposed to look. When the body looks that way, well, then it's not disgusting anymore. Um, eating, something, eating something that, that's normally, it's really very creaturely. Um, but we do it with a fork and a knife and we <laughs> disguise the animal origins of our food. We call it beef and not cow and we right. or a Big Mac or whatever it is. And we, we ritualize it. the whole experience. Right, right. Absolutely. All, all these things associated, all our, our animal type behaviors and our body, what we do is the ones that we don't keep hidden, we transform and make them symbolic. And so, so culture does that. Culture so a lot of our food rituals and Wine toasting and all that is, a, is to elevate this yeah, animals, bodily. Animals don't toast wine. No, <laughs> they don't. They... If they do, we want to put them on our show. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to the topic of this show, which is sex, human sexuality. Why is that so regulated in every culture? Right. In, well, in different ways, but in, it always has some sort of rules and, and strictures. Why is that? Well, sex is probably one of the most creaturely things that we can do. I mean, evolution works by reproduction, right? And it's obvious that attitudes towards sex aren't wholly negative. I mean, there are very positive aspects of it, but yet people seem to be very ambivalent about sex. And in the research that I've been doing with, with my colleagues, what we've suggested is that sex, what it does is it reminds us of our animalistic nature. And so even though it's very wonderful it's also threatening. It also reminds us of the fact that we're like an animal, and being like an animal reminds us that inevitably we're going to die. And it takes us out of control of ourselves, mm -hmm. and that's, that's also threatening to the, the symbolic creature that's trying to right. hold on to yep. control of, the, of the, the world. But what about love? How does that play into the, this perspective on sex? Well, just, I mean, just like we were talking about with what culture does is that takes things that are threatening and makes them not threatening, makes them symbolic. Well, love is probably something that we think of, romantic love we think of as being uniquely human. And so what it does is elevate sex from 
an act that the animals do, and it makes it something uniquely human, something beautiful, something special. So you're saying love is actually a construct, a way for us to justify having well, sex. I mean, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that lo- that's the only function. Uh, that, that's the only function. <laughs> Being of a love. newlywed, recently back from her honeymoon, would you like to tell us that, that, that there's no such thing as love? I knew you were going to bring that up. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were going to bring that up. <laughs> it's inevitable. Okay. No, I mean, I would not argue that the only function of love is to help us defend against the creatureliness of sex, but that. I would argue is one function that that you know that that's what it does. There's other there's other evolutionary reasons why we would have love and to keep you know our pair bonds together. But for human beings, one of the things it does psychologically is it makes sex not threatening. It's no longer something like animals do. It's something that we can do to celebrate something that's uniquely human and very beautiful. I mean. Plays are written about it, and you know it's it's celebrated. It's like kind of like the probably the highest the aspect main, of our culture. It's the main thing that's I mean, celebrated. Yeah, a thousand times a day on every radio station in yeah. America. Yeah. Right, mm-hmm. every popular song yeah. ever written, just about. Uh, besides love, are there other ways that sex can be meaningful? Sure. I mean, it doesn't have to be just love. If sex is used as a way to make you feel like a stud, you know, your sexual prowess or I remember um, that. <laughs> it was a while or, back, but you have or, a good memory. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe being desired. So if somebody desires you and that sex makes you feel that, that also can be a source of self esteem and makes it symbolic. Very um, important in our culture to feel desired. Right. Procreation, too. I mean, that's something that we've, <laughs> in popular culture, I think we sort of forget about that. That sex, if it's sex for the desire to procreate, that if people derive self-esteem from bearing children, maybe in a lot of cultures, male offspring, that says something really good about the family, then that can serve the same function as love. Love is probably the most popular and it's probably the most Marketing. celebrated. And Now, in your research, in terror management research, how does awareness of death affect the appeal of sex? Well, <laughs> we find that it very much matter, matters whether or not how neurotic an individual is. We find that for some individuals that when we remind them of their mortality, that what happens is their the appeal of sex becomes less appealing. And for other individuals, when we remind them of death, the appeal of sex becomes it becomes more appealing. In my research, I've kind of focused on the idea that there's threats associated with sex because we don't think of that. I mean, sex is just very positive. And so, of course, there's going to be reasons why people would embrace it. And so we find for people who are better psychologically adjusted that when you remind them of death that they embrace the life-affirming aspects of sex but for other people who are more conflicted about it when you remind them of death then they distance from it so it kind of gets at this ambivalence about sex so neurosis is the thing making the distinction in what you're saying there. yeah we find that in our research that neuroticism is a, a moderating variable okay Maybe we should go back and talk about neurosis. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should define neurosis from a terror management perspective. Okay. Basically, what Becker suggests and terror management suggests is that, you know, at some level we're all neurotic. That neuroticism means that we're denying the truth of our existence. But some people are better at these lies than other people, or convincing themselves of the validity of these lies than other people. And so the neurotic person is somebody that has more trouble with these defenses that we use to manage existential concerns than the person who's lower in neuroticism. Almost like a performance. A neurotic person is not as well trained as a performer. I remember or, saying or convincing that. The, convincing the, or convincing themselves. Convincing. So performing them to themselves, too. That, okay. you know, that we all kind of... We're all in a drama. We're, we're all, all in a, we're all in a drama, but yeah. the people that are better adjusted, so then they're, the people who are lower in neuroticism are better able to feel like the drama is meaningful. Working for them. And working for them. So they're comfortable with it, whereas people who are... And this is you know a continuous variable. People that are, who are higher on it are the ones who... It's not working as well, so they, they are more threatened by this. And, you know, we really see neuroticism as a variable to kind of deconstruct this ambivalent relationship that people have with, their, with sex and really to highlight kind of the normal human condition. that It's just more exaggerated in people who are high in neuroticism. So they bring out this ambivalence because they're 
buffers or their defenses aren't as well in place. So I'm not understanding. So okay. if you people who are aware of death and are not neurotic, how are they responding to... Well, they are neurotic. The they're they're less, I'm they're sorry, right. less neurotic. I'm sorry, <laughs> they're we're all neurotic. They're less neurotic. Less neurotic. So, I mean, but, so, so what, it's a question of degree. So, right. A degree, and so the, that they're defending, they're still defending, but they're distren- defending in a way that works better for them. So their defenses are more kind of make them more psychologically secure. So Whereas, sex is more appealing. In other words, I, we're talking about people who are who are more aware of of their own death. Well, not necessarily that that, okay. that their defenses against death okay. aren't that doesn't they don't buffer them as well. So when we remind them of death, they kind of tend to respond in more negative ways. So they're more threatened by other things that are going to remind them of their mortality. Whereas people who are lo- who are lower in neuroticism, so people who are better adjusted, quote better adjusted, the, mm-hmm. <laughs> who are just less neurotic, what we find is that when we remind them of death, that they can kind of embrace the physical aspects of sex. So then, taking a date to a horror movie is a good idea. Well, it, depends, it depends who you're it depends, dating. It depends yeah. who your date is. <laughs> right. A, a if you, less if, neurotic date. If you're convinced that your date is, is better well balanced, adjusted and right. you can, we have a personality inventory that we've used, which I can provide for your dates if you uh, like. We, we need I'm it. through with dating, but I just, just theoretically. So in other words, if your date is less neurotic, a well-adjusted person, than a horror movie that reminds them of death. It's probably a good idea. It's probably a good idea. It's for like, scoring... Probability. I wasn't going there, but yes, you were. <laughs> Don't try to foist <laughs> this off on me. Okay, all right, all right. All right. Yeah, we, have, we haven't actually done a controlled study looking at that, but it, it makes sense that Steve that would they like may... to participate when you do. Okay. I, no, I'm happily married. I know you are. For the record. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about beauty. What's the function of beauty, and why is physical attractiveness important? Well, again, you know, this idea that we can transform our physical selves into something symbolic. The beauty is also another way of doing this. So we take our bodies and we transform them from just mere physical bodies and we make them objects of art, objects of worship, objects of devotion. Something, and then they become less threatening. Something other than a body or what something it is. Other, something other than a body becomes an object, a symbol. Hmm. So it's kind of a blatant twisting of the truth, really. I remember Becker saying, when we render ourselves other than we are, we render ourselves grotesque. Or mm-hmm. I can't remember what the quote's from. So why, I guess this is, this is why there's so much discrimination then against people who don't fit the cultural norm, who are obese, bald, yeah. or, or too thin, or, or their faces aren't perfect. Symmetrical. Uh, symmetrical. Can you comment on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I mean, if, and any transgression against some kind of cultural norm or standard, you know, could be responded to with, with disgust, and people are threatened by that. But it seems that when it's something associated with the physical body, that this is particularly the case, that the cultural rules about the body, how the body should behave, how the body should perform, how the body should look, are so important because the body is something that, you know, is so connected to our animality. So it seems like those types of transgressions are particularly threatening to people. People are particularly likely to respond with hostility towards people who violate those norms. So that's why, really, we're in a culture that where physical appearance is at a premium mm-hmm. to the point where people are undergoing pretty painful and, and risky surgery sure. to maintain not only sex appeal, but just to conform to that look. I mean, mm-hmm. it's important for business. It's important, you know, in, in every aspect of life now, physical appearance. It's, it's, it's an epidemic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it makes sense, too. I mean, it, it's not it's not stupid to do that because, again, that these are the cultural standards that we adhere to, and they serve such a deep psychological function in helping to protect us from existential anxiety. And so it sort of makes sense that people are so willing to conform to these standards. And they also, it also has to do with evolutionary factors as well. The reason that the symmetrical face is attractive to us mm-hmm. has to do with clues that it gives us about the genetic makeup of the individual. And that says that that individual is a good person for carrying a child. Or Right, right. The contents of the standards are 
probably influenced by evolutionary factors, but then of course they become way extreme. So they're the, the, you know, the, the aspects of physicality that we find attractive aren't always healthy, <laughs> but mm. rather they, they probably stem from those perspectives and then they become more exaggerated. So how would you sum up then the, the human condition with respect to the, the role of the body and, and physical pleasure? How do, how do we find ourselves now in this, this 21st century? I think that it's paradoxical. The attitude that the body and the body's potential for pleasure are what make us feel most alive. Physicality is, is being alive, but at the same time, being alive reminds us that inevitably we're going to die. And so on some level, and of course, I mean, again, I'm talking about ambivalence, so it's not just all negative that we're all like just distancing from the body, but on some level, we're threatened by this. It threatens our death denial, and so we, we distance from it. But yet we're obsessed with sex. It's in every single television show. I mean, I don't think you can watch a TV show without reference to every sitcom, every but every drama, every every music video. It's every in every media. What it's, is the? It's thing? controversial. I mean, we're not obsessed with things that are all good. We're obsessed with things that have some aspects of it that are very appealing, but then have some controversy. And so, sex is like that. I mean, sex of all the aspects of our physicality, like the bathroom. You know, there's I guess there's there's some okay. pleasure in that, but. Sex is so appealing, we're so attracted to it, and yet it poses this threat. And so that makes it more, you know, that makes it so controversial. It wouldn't be so threatening if we weren't so attracted to it. It seems like the strongest opponents to, to references to sex are conservative religious groups. Is there any basis for that? Have you come across anything like that in your, in, in your, in your research? What, what is the relationship between... <laughs> without getting neuroticism you, into the... Yeah, without getting neuroticism into the... Well, I, uh, I mean... It, you must. It just seems... Doesn't it seem that way? That, yeah, that, I mean... That's the... Well, the, that, you know, you could look at one of the major functions of religion, I suppose, is, is death denial. And so if you're going to have a prescription for how to deny our mortality, well, then sex is, is very threatening to this. And then also, I mean, the control that, that sex threatens this, this, this ability to be wholesome and pure. pure and that it's an outright threat to a religious worldview. So then, how do we improve our enjoyment of life and our physical being and enjoy more of our physical pleasures? It's, it's, it's a, a hard question. I mean, I think, well, for one, we see that in our research that not everybody responds to existential concerns by distancing from sex. Some people actually embrace it. And so it may be, so one critical ingredient seems to be having a meaningful worldview. So having a sense of meaning and a sense of value can help provide the protection that may be necessary in order to be able to embrace the more positive aspects associated with sex in the body. And then, you know, also maybe just being aware of what, it, what is it that's so threatening about it, being aware of this can help us to, to not be th so threat, you know, again, to like make the threatening aspects less critical and again, be able to embrace the more life affirming, positive aspects of sex. So if you've got some other part of your life that's really working and holding you together, then you might be able to have better sex. Sure. Whatever it is to make you more psychologically well adjusted and, and have sustained some kind of sense of meaning, then, yeah, then you should be better able to approach the positive aspects. Jamie, thank you very much for a, for a terrific conversation. Our guest has been Dr. Jamie Goldenberg. Thank you for being our guest on Perspective. You've been listening to an interview with Jamie Goldenberg discussing sex, the human body, and their role in our culture. So, Ken, what's your takeaway? Steve, I like what she said about the civilizing process, that we are cognitively sophisticated animals, and we live largely on a symbolic, abstract plane. So our body is a real problem for us because it constantly threatens to remind us of our animality. I don't think most people think of their body as a problem, but in this context, it is. It is. It's a threat. Yeah, it's a threat to our psychological solution to death anxiety. Our bodies remind us that we're animals and animals die. It's an important idea. It is an important idea, Steve. 
as we hope most of these ideas are that we're discussing. Uh, yeah. Now we have to talk. This Here's an interesting idea, one most people have never discussed. It's a uniquely human quality. Uh, it's both an ideological and a physical response. And here's something I'd never thought about. Disgust blurs the boundary between our symbolic and our animal selves. Isn't that an interesting thing to think? Of? Again, uh, an important idea. It is. It is. So blurring the boundary between symbolic and animal selves. And I remember thinking then, and I know you get tired of me talking about temperament and type, but I think temperament enters here to a degree because I have been aware of the disgust reflex for a few years now. And I noted that my cousin, who I lived with for a while, had a much higher disgust reflex than I do. And it didn't take much to set him off. And a couple of times I really didn't even realize that how much that it was upsetting him because what was happening wouldn't upset me in the least. I wasn't sure that he wasn't kidding. So I was learning a little more about my friend. And people do have widely varying disgust thresholds. So Dr. Goldenberg mentions bodily fluids as one thing to invoke disgust, and she makes a pretty gross list, including feces, mucus, blood. She actually says especially menstrual blood, which really puts a shiver for a lot of people. She's an expert in the psychology of women's bodies. And she's probably done testing where she did the question both ways, and she got much different responses when she added that word. Mm -hmm. So she knows to say especially that. She also wondered whether evolution could have played a role in that being afraid of those or disgusted by those things might prevent you from getting sick from them. Certainly a lot of those, a lot of those fluids can contain pathogens that could be a real problem uh, and make you sick. Makes sense. And I thought it was really interesting when she pointed out that there is one human bodily fluid that does not disgust people. Do you remember what it is, Steve? I do, of course, tears. Tears. And the reason is because we're the only animal that cries in sorrow and other emotions like sometimes joy. Are we really? We're the only animal that has yeah. water, salty water come out of our eyes? Well, crocodiles do, but not out of sadness. It's some other kind of physical reflex. So that's why when somebody is crying, but you don't really believe them, you say they're crying crocodile tears. Oh, I never knew that. There you go. <laughs> you learn some wow, new stuff Wow, you here. learn all kinds of things. Well, anyway, I, I had never thought of it before, but yes, tears are not gross. No. And they're like the only, they're like the only thing that comes off our body that isn't gross. Yep. Weird, isn't it? So then it was funny that we were talking about how the culture is a mask over a lot of this and how we sort of rename things so that we don't have to keep thinking what it actually is. Oh, yeah. The bathroom is the perfect example that we bring up in the interview with Jamie. Right. But we, bathroom. We didn't, we didn't mention, you know, that we powder our nose in the powder room or store water in the water closet <laughs> or wash in the washroom and the lavatory or rest in the restroom. I'm not sure what we do in the head, but I, your imagination can fill that one in. I'm going to be quiet. Yeah, can things in the can, do whatever in the john, the latrine, and the crapper. You know, it goes on and on. It's interesting. I, I, never, I never thought of, I knew they were slang, but I never thought about why we needed them. Right. Now, the crapper was named after Thomas Crapper, an English plumber. A little trivia. Yes, here you go. Who invented the ball cock. Okay. There's a word for <laughs> it. It had a well-known brand of toilet, and so the toilets became known as the crapper because it said so, I guess, written on it or somewhere. And they shortened that word to be a word for what goes into the crapper, back formation. Boy, I wonder what kind of... That, that's a real legacy Isn't to it? have the word crap be named after yes. you. Yes, and then John, the John was invented by Sir John Harrington, a courtier of Queen Elizabeth the First. I looked all the. I don't know this. Oh, but I did, oh come I, on! I I looked this. Pull up. the other one. No, I knew about the crapper. That one I knew, but I didn't know about the John. I kind of knew about the crapper. I never did not know about Sir John. Sir Harrington, John Harrington. However. Yeah, yeah. 
Very important man. So culture's role is to take various aspects of human life, both real human life and physical human life, and make them symbolic, like eating with a knife and fork to make it less animalistic, you know, tearing the meat up on the floor. We sit at a table. We use a plate. We wipe our mouths carefully with napkins. Oh, yeah. None of these things do animals do. We call it a steak, not a cow, one level removed. Yep. Although I've, I have heard people, I believe my parents even, talk about steaks as the cow. We don't just drink wine, we will toast with wine. Elevates it above just just drinking. We have feasts. We have, we have feasts, yeah, we have, right. We have state dinners, right, where the heads of state have right. to eat together, right? George mm H.W. -hmm. Bush threw up on the... Japanese ambassador at one. <laughs> I what well, we digress. I had forgotten that. I <laughs> but, had forgotten you know, that. He was a human who had a human event episode. So that certainly yeah. is an event. So as you mentioned, culture tells us what aspects of animality to keep private, like defecating. Others are stripped of their animality yep. and replaced with rituals like dining and toasting with wine. These are cultural constructs. And when people get all bent out of shape because you mentioned the wrong thing, it's like, get over yourself. Everybody on this planet does this. We should be able to talk about it. Yeah. I remember noticing growing up that different families had different degrees of to which they right. would tolerate. Uh, this kind of discussion. And I think I even observed a correlation between income. Mm. Mm -hmm. And at the top end, you could almost call it snootiness, where someone won't say anything about anything real. But, you know, I had friends, you, public school brings you in contact with all different kids, and I was very thankful for that. But it was interesting what you could say in one person's house you absolutely could not say in another person's house. And most stand-up comedy nowadays is about bodily functions of one kind or another. <laughs> I guess, I guess uh, just that's about true. Every, it doesn't make right, it sound Just about very... every single one has to do with farting or dumping or sex or whatever. Yep. Or not doing yep. it or ha wanting to do it. And it's this endless stream of yeah. potty humor and whatever. And if you have a extreme disgust reflex kicking in, I'll bet it's quite off-putting to a lot of people. Some people, yeah, I'm sure. They don't go to those shows. They don't watch it. No. So sex is one of the most animal things, one of the most animal activities that we have. Right. And I, I, it was interesting. You pointed out during the interview that we lose control during sex. It's one place where you travel to another galaxy for at least a moment. Yep. If you're lucky. Yep. Those two facts make sex problematic. And like Jamie says, yes. sex is controversial. So on the one hand, we're attracted, but on the other hand, we're conflicted. And sex reminds us of our animalistic nature and therefore reminds us that we're going to die. It presents a conundrum. So we seek it as something that's most pleasurable and then reject it as most animal. And societies have multiple rules to control it. And that explains a hell of a lot. Here we doesn't go. Doesn't it? It really does. Yeah. It really does. And, you know, I had never thought about it before, but the first time I uh, heard someone use the term forced monogamy or culturally forced monogamy, it sounds very off putting, like, ah, oh, who would ever do that? But that's exactly what marriage is. That's what marriage is. Right. That's what it is. It's culturally forced monogamy. I mean, except for the Mormons, I guess. Some of that has to do with procreation. Yeah. Oh, a lot, I think a lot of it does. You had to keep people together so that you'd have somebody to bring the kids up. Well, it's a way for men his to historic know. Historically speaking. Yeah, historically speaking. It's a way for men to know for sure that the offspring is theirs because they know the woman hasn't been out of their sight long enough to go have sex with anybody else. So therefore, you're monogamous. Okay. Yeah. There you go. I mean, monogamy isn't necessarily natural, 
naturally monogamous? There are many societies where it doesn't happen. So now we're going to talk about love. And I had never thought of this before, this episode. We were talking about sex. Love is a cultural adaptation to make sex less animalistic and more human, more palatable, more lasting, more caring, make it have meaning, something beyond just doing it, as men would say. Love elevates sex. It makes it special. It makes it beautiful. I would say that would be the highest compliment that you could pay to the act of procreation would be to say that it's beautiful. Yeah, like at the beginning of the show, when we had that play on words, what's sex got to do with it? Obviously playing on the oh, yeah. playing on the Tina Turner song, What's Love Got to Do With It? Yes, you were. And I'd never thought about that song in that way before either. Right. So there's so many new things here. So love, the cultural construct, also functions to keep pair bonds together. And that was about procreation and making sure somebody was around to bring the kids up. And, which is equally likely, it was an invention of men. Marriage, particularly monogamous marriage, was the invention of men so they could keep track of who was the father of the offspring. Well, that's right, too. The women know who the mother of the offspring is. Right, because she's right there. They don't have to think about it. Right. But the man has to take her word for it. Well, if they're monogamous and she hasn't been out of his sight for months at a time, he's got a good idea that the kid is his, right. his heir, yep. whatever. And so in this society, in the agricultural society, not necessarily the hunter-gatherer society of our ancient ancestors, but in this agricultural society, that was extremely important right. to the men. right. It was their immortality project. So, and love also makes sex not threatening. Right, right. And Jamie says, we sometimes make the body an object of art. Again, making it a symbol. Well, that's right. So it's not threatening. So you remember the, the song, Video Killed the Radio Star? Yes, I do. I hadn't thought of it for a long time, but now that you say that, I do remember it. And it did. It was like the song that's, yeah, it's, I think it started every MTV episode or, you know, yeah. whatever. But you think about film and video, they favor certain looks, certain body types, being thin, being youthful, being beautiful. Right. My wife Goldie and I saw a movie the other night about love relationships between several male characters. And everyone in that movie, men and women, all looked like Abercrombie and Fitch models. Right. It was ludicrous. Every, every extra. That's a sign of a certain type of movie that somebody was signing on to make. Yeah, but our culture creates norms that the average person cannot achieve. And if they do manage to be beautiful in their youth, it can't last. Sorry, but it just doesn't. And what we consider ugly, fat, old, etc., right. is met with humor or disgust. That's right. She said that any transgression against a norm is met with disgust. In, in general, and in particular, yeah. in this instance. So you look at famous people in our society, look at our president, who wears orange makeup to appear tan, and therefore more youthful yep. and handsome, in his mind. And he wears baggy suits with padded shoulders to look thinner. Probably wears a girdle. That's speculation, but it's not me speculating it. And he lies about yep. his height so that his body mass index is not in the obese range. Sure. This is somehow all important to a political figure. Nice. So you, and you can count how many politicians like Nancy Pelosi, Mitt Romney, John Kerry, sure it is. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sarah Palin, and now Joe Biden, have had facelifts, fat injections into their sagging faces, Botox. They all pretend, and their spokespeople all will maintain adamantly that it didn't happen. They're trying to save face. Made a little pun there. Very funny. Very, very punny. Thank you. Our culture wants us to look a certain way 
but not to admit having plastic surgery for whatever reason. We're supposed to pretend that John Kerry just woke up one day and didn't have wrinkles on his forehead. Look at that. That's right. It's a miracle. It's amazing. Americans spend over $16 billion a year on cosmetic plastic surgery. That's a lot. That's a lot. So Jamie also commented that uh, the major function of religion is uh, death-denying, and sex is a problem for religion. Most religions and societies historically have forbidden polygamy. Right, and you can see why. They've got the same interest in it as the family unit, trying to make sure that somebody's there to raise kids, and also, as you said, being able to track lineage. But they want to control it. Yeah, yeah. I like the way Jamie ended up. To improve the enjoyment of life, have a meaningful worldview. Have a sense of meaning and value. Isn't that great advice? Love it. That's great. Yep. And she said, be, be aware of what is threatening and embrace what is life-affirming. Good words. Absolutely. Really good. So, folks, join us next time. Like us on Facebook. Please recommend us to your friends. You can find us at www.thehubforimportantideas.com. And support us on Patreon. We are 100% listener supported. Thank you for listening to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.